Okay, so this is part two of our current event and weekly Bible study for October 28th, 2007. And again, this part two is in reference to the zeitgeist. I don't know how many parts this is going to take me to get through, but um, where we had uh, left off, we're going to continue in regard to this film. The film next then states that a star in the east announced the birth of Jesus Christ. Uh announced his birth, and that three kings came to bring gifts to the Savior. Okay, now I'm sorry, this is in reference to Horus. This is what they're saying was Horus's life, okay? In, in other words, what they're trying to do is say that all, this whole, all the accounts about Jesus Christ, all they were, were repackaged Horus uh, teachings, okay? Which, again, we're going to debunk this. It, it's easily debunked. But the film, the zeitgeist, states that a star in the east announced Horus's birth and that three kings came to bring gifts to the, quote, Savior. However, when stories detailing the birth of Horus are examined, there is no star or three kings who come to visit him. Trying to link this to Christianity fails in any event as the account of Christ's birth in Matthew has magi, or wise men, not kings, coming to Jesus with their actual number not being stated. Finally, the movie calls Horus a savior. There are no descriptions of Horus being a savior to anyone or serving in that capacity at all, even in paganism. This is an, this is an important point. The movie takes the extreme, unsubstantiated liberty in the quick and subtle uses of Christian words and phrases that in no way accurately describe the actual pagan god or attribute being discussed. And again, they couldn't even get their paganism right in this movie. In this movie. This is seen again in the statements made of Horus being baptized and starting a ministry. The only accounts remotely related to Horus and water are stories told about Osiris, his father, who is sometimes combined in ancient accounts with Horus to form one individual whose body was cut up into 14 pieces by his enemies set, scattered throughout the earth. Isis then supposedly found each body part, except the phallus, and became the lord of the underworld. Oh, that, that story really parallels Jesus. Yeah, right. I mean, give me a break. Depending on which account is read, because there's other versions of this account, none of them come close to the account of Jesus Christ, though. In any event, stating that Horus was baptized is simply playing fast and loose with Christian terminology. In addition, Horus had no ministry. Horus becoming a teacher at the age of 12, mimicking Jesus' account at the temple as a youth is nowhere to be found in the account of Horus, neither are there any statements to the effect of him having twelve disciples. According to Horus accounts, Horus had four semi-gods that were followers and, and some indications of sixteen human followers, and an unknown number of blacksmiths that went with him into battle. No accounts of Horus being betrayed are found in his portrayals, like Jesus Christ was, and he certainly did not die by crucifixion on any account. There is an incident described in one story of Horus being torn to pieces with Isis requesting that the crocodile godfish fish him out of the water he was placed. Crocodile god fish him out of the water he was placed into. But the movie does not mention this as it does not fit their agenda. And that's what this movie is about, an agenda. The, the first 37 minutes to try to totally discredit any semblance of Christianity. Further, the movie puts the account of Horus as originating around 3000 BC, which predates the invention and the practice of the crucifixion. So there is another historical problem that must be overcome. It's pure lies. The first 37 minutes are pure lies in this movie. They don't even get their paganism right. The claims of Horus being buried for three days and resurrected are not to be found in any of the ancient Egyptian texts either. Now, we're going to look at this further. Okay, I'm giving a cursory view here. We're going to look at this further. Some accounts have Osiris being brought back to life by Isis and going to be the lord of the underworld. But there is not an account of Horus being in the grave for three days and then being resurrected. Or Horus physically coming out of the grave in the same physical body he went in with and never dying again. There's no account of this. And there's certainly no account of Horus dying for the sins of others as Jesus Christ did. In the end, the attempt to prove Horus was a picture 
or a forerunner of Jesus, simply fails from lack of historical evidence. The movie continues in the same vein that all the other mythological pagan deities that predated Jesus Christ, like Atias and Krishna, etc., as just another simple example that the Zeitgeist movie says that the Hindu's Krishna was also crucified and resurrected. Um... However, Hindu teachings clearly state that Krishna was killed by an arrow shot from a hunter who accidentally killed, hit him in his heel after he died. Well, that sounds like a repackaged Achilles to me. He was hit in the heel and then he died? Well, you ever heard the Achilles heel? Paganism borrows from paganism. Jesus Christ doesn't borrow for any, from any of it. None of the pagan deities, when accurately examined, mirror the Son of God recorded in the, New, in the New Testament Gospels. Of course, neither does the movie note these following facts that, that we're about to mention now. The many archaeological details confirming the New Testament accounts, because they're basically saying in the movie, Jesus never even existed. Okay, The historically confirmed references that run alongside the life of Christ, the early dating of the Gospel accounts during the lifetime of eyewitnesses, the deep moral convictions of the authors and their commitment to the truth, so much so that they were willing to die for their faith, like virtually all the apostles did. The accounts of the apostles going to their deaths for what they'd seen in regard to Jesus Christ, the typology of Jesus and Joseph used by the film to supposedly debunk the actual existence of Christ. Now, this I thought was really amazing when they started using Joseph and saying that Jesus Christ just copycatted Joseph. Joseph was a type of Christ. This is a way that actually Scripture was confirmed. There's many types of Christ in the Old Testament that shed light and point to Jesus Christ the Savior. But that doesn't discredit Christ. That confirms Christ. But this movie had the audacity to basically act like, oh no, this just proves that it's all false. Like the Bible says, won't it them to call evil good and good evil? Their, their, their logic is so flawed. And again, we're going to go into all this further. It is very well known and accepted by conservative Christian scholars that this Joseph being a type of Christ was a foreshadowing of the first coming of Jesus Christ. It's not anything I'm going to be ashamed about as a Christian for sure. It's something that, the, that I can point to as the Bible to actually confirm my faith. Not, not weaken it. Um, also, they don't mention all the good produced by Christianity. And I mean true Bible-believing Christianity. I don't mean Roman Catholicism here. There's a book written by a guy named Alvin Schmidt on, it's called How Christianity Changed the World by Dr. Alvin Schmidt that they reference here. All the good that produced by Christianity are totally brushed aside. The only thing that, that they mention in the Zeitgeist movie are things like the Crusades and, and the, um, uh, the Catholic slaughter of all these millions of people during the Inquisition. And other events like this are highlighted. And again, they're totally acting as though the Catholic Church is the Christian Church. And it's not. It's the farthest thing from it. Do you know, during the Inquisition, the people, most of the people that were being killed during the Inquisition were true Bible-believing Christians. And the reason they were being killed is because they were true Bible-believing Christians. See, there's a whole different line of Christians that, that were, again, the narrow path... There's few that be that find it, but there's a whole other line of Christians that came up from Antioch, where they were first called Christians, in Acts, that were the true born-again Christians. The Waldensians, the Lombards, the Anabaptists, these type of people. This is where I trace my lineage to. Okay, as far as looking back. There's a, there's a really good book written by a guy named Dr. Phil Stringer. It's called The Faithful Baptist Witness. Now, I don't believe it's so much as a matter of Baptist, a Baptist issue. Okay, at all. But the book does a very good job of documenting this separate line of people that came up. And you realize if you call yourself a Protestant, that means that you're basically saying that I came out of the Catholic Church. Because Protestants came out of the Protestant Reformation. They were protesting what was going on in the Catholic Church. Ultimately, and firstly, through Martin Luther. With the 95 Thesis thing nailed on the church door. Okay, that was how that all started. I don't, I don't associate myself with that. Okay, I don't. But most denominations in, to, in today's day and age that are that are call themselves Christian associate themselves with that. Call themselves Protestants. I don't call myself that. I call myself a Bible-believing Christian. Okay, born-again Bible-believing Christian. 
I don't put a denominational label on it. So, if we go further, um, in, in, in debunking this movie, this, this, in, this is in keeping with current militant atheistic mindset of there is only being violence in, in religion. In other words, what they try to present in the zeitgeist is that all religion is, is pure poison. Now, for the most part, they're right. But again, they throw the baby out with the bathwater and lump true Bible-believing Christians in with all the other, particularly the Catholic religion. Of course, violence done in the name of atheism and naturalism is not mentioned in the movie. Perhaps the most overlooked is the fact that Jesus' birth, life, death, and resurrection were prophesied hundreds of years in advance in the Old Testament, which was written by monotheistic Jews, who certainly would, would um, not have borrowed aspects from the pagan cults for their work. The person and life of Jesus, as lived out by the historically ver verified Nazarene carpenter, is nothing more than an unfolding of what had been predicted by the prophets of the Old Testament years before. Now, we're going to look at that in detail in a little bit here, okay? About the probability of Jesus Christ and all of the Old Testament scriptures that were fulfilled. We're going to look at that in detail. I'm going to, I'm going to continue here until we get to that point, and then we're going to delve into that. See, this movie attacks so many things that I found myself having to, to do a study on a lot of different related subjects. So it's interesting to note that the person of Jesus in Christianity is the only faith attacked in the movie. Oh, isn't that amazing? Islam, Hinduism, and others don't warrant a mention. Oh, Islam, that, that's a really great religion. You know, that, that's, that's a really great religion. But it doesn't warrant any attack. No, they need to attract, they need to attract the Christians. Though the faith of the producers is not exposed, of course, really, I think it is. There is a blurb at the end speaking to the effect that, quote, all is one. With a clip of the noted evolutionist materialist Carl Sagan being shown who says that all the earth is as, is as a single organism and that a new consciousness is being developed that shows all is one. Wow, sounds like, you know, high level new age to me. Well, they got to have some type of religious view. I mean, what do they believe? That we just die and, and uh, that's it? they got to have some religious view. I believe what they're probably trying to do is say, okay, all religions are just a, a tool of the devil, and that now we're going to shake off the chains of all religion, and we're going to evolve into a higher state. We're, we're going to become as ascended masters. This is one of the big lies of the, of the New Age movement. That you're going to be as gods. It's, it's the same lie that was given to Eve in the Garden of Eden. When he came to her and he said, you shall be as gods. It's a temptation. Quite frankly, in my current state, I don't want to be a god. I totally mess everything up. I'll, I'll, I'll leave that to the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Father God. I, I, I don't want to do that. Okay? So, at the end of the movie, religion is called a distraction, engineered by a secret group of people who are using it along with the media and other mechanisms to dumb down the population so they will accept the open arms of the coming one world government. Now, for the most part, there's a, there's a good chunk of that that's actually true. Most religion is being used for that. But they lump it all together. That's the problem. It is interesting that this appears to be the movie producer's main fear, the one world government, which is clearly predicted in the Bible. This is the one proposition put forth by the movie that is plausible insofar as it is backed by prophetic statements made in both the Old and the New Testaments. Daniel 1 and 2, that's, um, Daniel 1, Second uh, Thessalonians, and Revelation, assuming an eschatological stance such as premillennialism is viewed. Um, and then also this movie speaks to the ambition of the predicted one world ruler who is to come. The Bible talks about him as the man of sin, the Antichrist. It is interesting also to note that the movie quotes Jesus, someone they say never existed, from John 8.32, where it says, You will know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Well, actually, the full verse says, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Okay, so they're, they're, they don't read the full verse. 
Okay, they just, they're just wanting you to accept their version of truth, which is not even truth, it's a lie. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, the word of God, the King James Bible, then are you my, my disciples indeed. So that's an earmark of a Christian. Are you continuing in God's word? Are you even reading God's word? Are you reading some perversion? Although they misquote the verse by saying, you must seek the truth and the truth will set you free. End of quote. The producers of the Zeitgeist movie, unfortunately, do not do this. They don't take their own advice. Well, who is that? What is that? That's hypocrite. That's hypocrisy, right? They do not do this and instead choose to align themselves with very questionable and outright fabricated sources to malign Christianity, true Bible-believing Christianity, and label it... Now, if they were to come out and, and say a lot of what they said about Catholicism, actually, it's pretty true. Because Catholicism is repackaged paganism. That's true. But they don't do that. They don't separate the two. And that's the damnable heresy within this movie. It's all by design from Satan. He's the most subtle beast of the field. He's very good at what he does. Don't underestimate him. The Bible says he seeks as a roaring lion, goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He's going to devour a lot of people with this heresy. So, they, they do this... They align themselves with very questionable and outright fabricated sources to malign Christianity and label it in all religions as pawns being used by a secret organization they claim is currently working to take over the world. One thing is for certain, reaching such a conclusion using faulty materials certainly requires a lot of faith. Much more faith, in fact, than it takes to accept the truth of the Bible and the historical validity of Jesus Christ. It's like, it's like believing in evolution. It takes a lot more faith to believe that I ultimately came from a rock. Oh, well, no, it's not a rock. We came from a monkey. Oh, okay, where did the monkey come from? Well, from, like, the, uh, I don't know, some kind of amphibian creature that, oh, well, where did that come Well, some come kind of fish. Well, where did that come from? Well, some kind of two-celled amoeba that was in the water. Well, where did that come from? Well, the Bible, where evolution teaches that the rain rained on the rocks for millions of years, and out of the primordial soup so formed a, a two-cell amoeba, and that two-cell amoeba sprouted gills, and ultimately got on dry land, and then turned into a stinking monkey, and then it became a human being. That takes a lot of faith to believe that. Way more than, than believing, thus saith the Lord, in seven days, God created the earth, and He made man and woman. And he created man in His image. To me, it takes a lot more to believe evolution. But see, that's the links that people will go in order to justify their devilish, hellish lifestyle. They'll do anything they've got. They'll believe anything they've got to believe in order to justify their hellish lifestyle. So they, that, so that hopefully, ultimately, they won't have to answer to a holy God for the life they've lived. That's what it all boils down to. They don't want to be accountable. Everybody wants a way out. There's no way out. The only way out is through Jesus Christ. The narrow way, which leadeth to life eternal. But the Bible says, unfortunately, few there be that find it. Now, I pray to God that all that would even be listening to this get saved. The Bible says it's his will that not one would perish, but that all would come to repentance. And that God takes no death in the pl pleasure in the death of the wicked. That's why I'm doing this. Because putting this type of stuff out sure won't make you popular. So going further here, um, Christians should not be surprised that such unfounded claims are invented in the imagination of unbelievers and passed along by others as fact. And in reality, they are, ex they are expected. Peter writes in his first epistle, let's go ahead and read the Second Peter 2.1. 2 Second Peter 2.1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, which is what we talked about today, that's where that word comes from, even denying the Lord that brought them, and bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways. This is what I think about with the Zeitgeist movie. Many is going to follow this. By reason of whom the way of truth shall, 
be evil spoken of. That's what the zeitgeist does. It causes the way of truth to be evil spoken of. That's the ultimate goal here. And through covetousness shall they with feigned and false words, in other words, false words, make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. See, these people are going to hell, and they're wanting to take as many people to hell with them as they can. I wouldn't want to be in their shoes. These people putting out this filth. So let's go further. Question. Did Jesus really exist? Is there any historical evidence of Jesus Christ? Because this has to be addressed. Okay, I mean, I think it's pretty asinine. We're going to address it right now. Answer. Typically when, the, when this question is asked, the person asking qualifies the question with outside the Bible. Is there any proof outside the Bible that Jesus Christ existed? Okay? Because they don't believe the Bible. They just think it's a book of fairy tales or whatever. So, we do not want to grant this idea that the Bible cannot be considered a source of evidence for the existence of Jesus. The New Testament contains hundreds of references to Jesus Christ. There are those who date the writing of the Gospels in the 2nd century AD, uh, plus 100 years after Jesus' death. Even if this were the case, which we strongly dis dispute, in terms of ancient evidences, writings less than 200 years after events took place are considered very reliable evidences. Further, the vast majority of scholars, Christian and non-Christian, will grant that the epistles of Paul were in fact written by Paul in the middle of the first century AD, less than 40 years after the death of Jesus Christ. In terms of ancient manuscript evidence, this is an extraordinary strong proof of the existence of Jesus Christ in Israel in the first century AD. It is also important to recognize that in 70 AD, the Romans invaded and destroyed Jerusalem and most of Israel, slaughtering its inhabitants. Entire cities were literally burned to the ground. We should not be surprised then if much of the evidence of Jesus Christ's existence was destroyed at that time, many of the eyewitnesses of Jesus would have been killed. These facts likely limited the amount of surviving eyewitnesses to the testimony of Jesus Christ. Considering the fact that Jesus' ministry was largely confined to a relatively unimportant area in a small corner of the Roman Empire, a surprising amount of information about Jesus can be drawn from secular historical sources. Some of the more important historical evidences of Jesus include the following. Number one, the first century Roman Tactus, who is considered one of the more accurate historians of the ancient world, mentioned the, the superstitious, quote, Christians, named after Christus, which is Latin for Christ, who suffered under Pontius Pilate during the reign of Tiberius. Suetonius, chief secretary to the emperor Hadrian, wrote that there was a man named Christ who lived during the first century, and this is what I'm telling you here is referenced, okay? So when I give you the... I'm not going to cite every reference today, but when I... If you access this PDF, you're going to have access to all these references, okay? Uh, Flavius Josephus, uh, most famous Jewish historian in his antiquities... Okay, so Flavius uh, Josephus, in his antiquities, he refers to James, the brother of Jesus, who was called Christ. Now, again, a lot of who we're going to be quoting today are from secular sources. But isn't this what the people in the zeitgeist say doesn't exist? They're saying that the Bible is some made-up book that doesn't have any merit, essentially. Well, what about all these secular sources that, that talked about Jesus Christ, matter-of-factly? What about them? I mean, they're not even Christians. You can't accuse them of being biased. There is, there is a controversial verse that, um, uh, let's see, 1813, that says, Now there was about this time Jesus a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was the one who wrought surprising feats. He was the Christ. He appeared to them alive again the third day, as the divine prophets had foretold these, and ten thousand other wonderful things concerning him. Now again, this is, this is from Flavius Josephus, a Jewish historian, Jewish historian in his antiquities, he refers to James, the brother of Jesus, who's called Christ. This is what we're talking about. This is from this antiquities. Okay? Another one of uh, the quotes from his antiquities reads, At the time, there was a wise man named Jesus. His conduct was good, and he was known to be virtuous. And many people from among the Jews and other nations became his disciples. Pilate condemned to be crucified and to die. But those who became his disciples did not abandon his discipleship. They reported that he appeared to them three days after the crucifixion, and that he was alive according to what... according he was perhaps the Messiah concerning whom the prophets have reaccounted wonders. End of quote. 
from a secular Jewish historian. Oh, but Jesus never existed. Oh, okay, whatever. Julius Africanus quotes the historian Thallius in a discussion of the darkness which followed the crucifixion of Christ. Remember that in the Bible? Well, that's discussed. Here's by another guy, Julius Africanus. I had a brother named Julius Africanus. I don't know if you knew that. No, just kidding. Sorry. Pliny the Younger, now he had another brother named Pliny the Older. No, sorry. Pliny the Younger, in letters from 1096, recorded early Christian worship practices, including the fact that Christians worshipped Jesus as God and were very ethical, and includes a reference to the Lord's Supper. The Babylonian Talmud, which is which is, is is against Jesus Christ as you could possibly be in the Sanhedrin 43a, concerns Jesus Christ and his crucifixion on the eve of Passover. That's the Babylonian Talmud, who hates Jesus Christ. So how many secular sources do you want? Lucian of Samosoda was a 2nd century Greek writer who admits that Jesus was worshipped by Christians, introduced new teachings, and was crucified for them. He said that Jesus' teachings included the brotherhood of believers, the importance of conversion, the importance of denying other gods, Christian lived, Christians lived according to Jesus' laws, and were characterized by um, contempt for death, voluntary self-devotion, and renunciation of material goods. Okay? Now again, I'm not saying everything they're saying about Christians were accurate. I'm saying this is what they're acknowledging Jesus Christ was a historical figure. Is the whole point of all of this. There's another guy. Mara Bar Seraph Ser Serapion confirms that Jesus was brought was thought to be a wise and virtuous man was considered by many to be the king of Israel was put to death by the Jews and lived on in the teachings of his and lived on in the teachings of his followers. Then we have the Gnostic Gospels, which one's called the Gospel of Truth, the Apocryphon of John, the Gospel of Thomas, the Treatise of the Resurrection, all mention Jesus Christ. Now again, a lot of these are, are not sources I want to quote, but the point is, these are pagan, some of them are outright pagan, some of them are outright secular sources, confirming that Jesus was a true historical figure. You can't really accuse them of being biased. In fact, we can almost reconstruct the gospel just from the early non-Christian sources. Jesus was called Christ by Josephus. Um, was hanged on was hanged on a cross on Passover for them. Babylonian Talmud says this. In Judea, Tacitus says this. Or ta Tacitus? Tacitus. But claimed to be God and would return. By Eleazar said this. Which, which, his, which his followers believed, worshipping him as God, Pliny the Younger. So in other words, you can piece all this together, even from secular sources. In conclusion, there is overwhelming evidence for the existence of Jesus Christ, both in the secular and the biblical history. Perhaps the greatest evidence that Jesus did exist is the fact that literally thousands of Christians in the first century AD, including the twelve apostles, were willing to give their lives as martyrs for Jesus Christ. People will die for what they believe to be true, but no one will die for what they know to be a lie. To me, I think that's the best proof of it all. All these martyrs that have been burned at the stake and tortured in horrific ways for Jesus Christ, do you think they would do that for a lie? No. Because when the Holy Spirit comes and dwells within you, there's a change that takes place. And there's an assurance that takes place in your spirit. These are things that are on a spiritual level. It can't really, it's hard to relay them. But the Bible makes much mention of this. That we're sealed by the Holy Spirit under the day of redemption. These types of things. So, you know, the Bible talks about, Come let us reason together, saith the Lord. Well, that's what we're doing here today. We're trying to reason this thing out. Okay, now, let's go further with Jesus Christ. Let's talk about the law of probability. Now, this is one of the things I sent out to somebody that says, Oh, Jesus, you know, this or that never existed. The law of probability. After examining only 48 different prophecies, even though there's 456, do you realize there's 456 prophecies in the Old Testament relating to Jesus Christ? So, let's look at 48 of them. 48, okay, in the Old Testament, that clearly predicted... Certain, certain events of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? After examining only 48 different prophecies, 
Professor Emeritus of Science at Westmont College, Peter Stoner, has calculated the probability of one man fulfilling just 48 of the 456 prophecies made regarding Jesus Christ. Okay, we're going to look at this probability in a second here. Now, again, this is a reference thing. This was, this was um, from Science Speaks, Chicago, Moody Press, 1963, Peter W. Stoner. This was, this was clear back in 1963 this was done. Bear in mind, these Old Testament prophecies were written by, by different unrelated authors of the Bible hundreds to thousands of years earlier than Jesus was even born. Okay, 12 different classes of 600 college students worked out the estimates. Okay, so what they're trying to do here is be objective. The students carefully weighed all the factors, discussed each prophecy at length, and examined the various circumstances which might indicate that men had conspired together to fulfill a particular prophecy. In, order, in other words, men had, had conspired together to contrive Jesus Christ. Okay, so they, they, they tried to be the devil's advocate and look at both sides. These 600 students made their estimates conservative enough so that they, when they were finally unanimous, so that they were finally unanimous in their agreement, even among the most skeptical, skeptical students. Okay, so in other words, they're really trying to, to be um, err on the side of safety and err on the side of almost even skepticism. Okay, these estimates were even agreed to by the most skeptical of the 600 students. Not only that, but when Professor Stoner took their estimates, he made them even more conservative. He also encouraged other skeptics and scientists to make their own estimates to prove that his conclusions were even more fair. How much more fair can you be? Finally, he submitted his figures for review to a committee of the American Scientific Affiliation. Upon exa examination, they verified his calculations were dependable and accurate in regarding to the scientific material, material presented. Okay, now this is in regard to Jesus Christ. For example, concerning Micah 5.2 where it states the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Stoner and his students determined that the average population of Bethlehem from the time of Micah to present, then they divided it by the average population of earth during the same period. They concluded that the chance of one man being born in Bethlehem was 2.8 times 10 to the 5th power, or 1 in 300,000. Okay, that was just... It was 1 in 300,000 chance that a, any particular man would actually be born in Bethlehem with all the other parameters that we just talked about. In his final calculation, Stoner, Professor Stoner used 48 prophecies, even though he could have used 456 regarding Jesus Christ, from the Old Testament. Now, we're talking about the Old Testament. He used 48 prophecies and arrived at the extremely conservative estimate that the probability of 48 prophecies being fulfilled by one person is 10 to the 157th power. How large a number is 10 to the 157th power? 10 to the 157th power contains 157 zeros. That's the probability of Jesus fulfilling just 48 of the 456 in the Old Testament. And he fulfilled all of them. Let's try to illustrate this number by using electrons, which is basically the smallest particle that they're there is. Electrons are very small. They are smaller than atoms. It would take 2.5 times 10 to the 15th power of, of them laid side by side to make one inch. So 2.5 2 times um, basically 2.5 with 15 zeros behind them. It would take that many electrons laid side by side to make one inch. Okay. Even if we counted four electrons every second and counted and counted day and night, it would still take us 19 million years just to count a line of electrons one inch. That's how many of them there are. Okay. How many electrons would there be if we were dealing with 10 to the 157th power? <laughs> Imagine building a solid ball of electrons that would extend in all directions from the Earth 6 billion light years. Are you conceiving this? Let me say that again. Imagine building a solid ball of electrons that would extend in all directions from the Earth 6 billion light years. Light years. Light years is when you travel the speed of light 
and how many, how far you can go in a year traveling the speed of light is one light year. We're talking about building a ball of electrons that would extend in all directions from the Earth six billion light years. The distance in miles of just one light year is 6.4 trillion miles. <laughs> just one. And we're talking about six billion. That would be a big ball. Yeah. Not big enough but not big enough to measure 10 to the 157th power of electrons. <laughs> that's, a, that's how big of a number we're talking about here. Not big enough. In order to do that, you, would, you must take the big ball of electrons reaching the length of 6 billion light years in all directions and multiply it by 6 times 10 to the 28th power. How big is that? It's the length of space required to store trillions and trillions and trillions of the same gigantic balls more and more. In fact, the space required to store all these balls combined together would just start to scratch the surface of the number of electrons we would need to accurately speak about 10 to the 157th power. Assuming that you have some idea of the number of electrons we're talking about, imagine marking just one of those electrons in that huge number, stirring them up. Now remember, these electrons go out 6 billion light years in all directions. You got all these electrons, the smallest, smallest unit of measurement on the planet. And you mark one of those electrons that goes out six billion years in all directions. Mark one. That's why you get one. Stir them all up. Take your big mixing spoon. Stir them up. Like a mixing spoon on steroids. You're going to have to use a big one. Then, appointing one person to travel in a rocket for as long as he wants in any direction of the six billion light years. So he's traveling in this rocket anywhere he wants to go. Now tell him to stop the rocket in space wherever he wants to stop it. Take a high-powered microscope. Find that one mark electron. Talk about a needle in a haystack. That's beyond a needle in a haystack. What do you think his chances of being successful would be? It would be 110 to the 157th power. That's what his chances would be. Remember, this number represents the chances of only 48 of the prophecies coming true regarding Jesus Christ. Whereas he could have used 456. In financial terms, is there anyone who would not invest in a financial venture if the failure were only 1 to the, to the 157th power? 10 to the 157th power? I don't think so. This kind of sure investment we are offered by God for belief in Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, all illustrates, all this illustrates why it is important, why it is absolutely impossible for anyone to have fulfilled the Messianic prophecies by chance. This is the kind of evidence that proves there must be a God who supernaturally gave us this information. Let's keep in mind that we've only illustrated 48 out of the 456 Messianic prophecies. Out of over 8,000 total verses in the Bible regarding prophecy, of which thousands of verses have already been fulfilled of them as well. Also remember that these prophecies were written anywhere from hundreds to thousands of years earlier by different unrelated men that lived, for the most part, in totally different eras of time. It wasn't like one guy did all this. It's a compilation. Jesus Christ's life is a historical fact. His birth year is how we divide time. Did you realize that? A.D., B.C., before Christ, you know? But no, now, now it's B.C.E. It's the new improved, it's actually the unimproved version. B.C.E., they've got to change now, Doug. Before Common Era. But you know what? All before that it was B.C., before Christ. It's how we divide time. And you're telling me his life wasn't a historical fact? And he never existed? What a lie. There were many other confirmations of Jesus Christ's existence by various record keepers of this era. We've already looked at those. So, if you have not already done so, please accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and receive His free gift of salvation today. There's no more important decision that you will ever make. Now, there, in this thing, there's a, there's a, uh, a link that you can go to. Uh, if you go to www.chick.com, you can look under salvation. You can email me. Um, I'll get you this information in regard to um, to becoming a born-again Christian, which is the most important decision you will ever make, bar none. Nothing could even compare to it. Now, 
The argument has also been made that Jesus deliberately fulfilled these prophecies, but most of the prophecies were completely beyond his control. Such as his place of birth, Micah 5.12, the time of his birth, Daniel 9.25 and Genesis 49.10, the manner of his birth, Isaiah 7.14, his betrayal, Psalm 41.9, Zechariah 11.12, Zechariah 11.13, the manner of his death, Psalm 22.16, the people's reactions, uh, mocking, spitting, staring, which was talked about in, oh my word, Isaiah 56, Micah 5.1, Psalm 22, 7 and 8, Isaiah 53, 3, Psalm 69, 8, Psalm 118, verse 22, Psalm 69, verse 4, Isaiah 49, verse 7, Psalm 38, verse 11, Psalm 22, verse 7, Psalm 109, verse 25, Psalm 22, verse 17. Here's how he was pierced, according to Zechariah 12.10 and Psalms 22.16 and his burial, Isaiah 53.9. Another argument is that the prophecies were written at or after the time of Jesus, and that were therefore fabricated. The problem with this argument was that the historic date of the completion of the Old Testament was 450 B.C. So approximately 450 years before he was even born, these prophecies were already set in stone. The Greek translation of the Hebrew Scriptures was was initiated in the reign of Ptolemy Philadelphus around... 285 to 246 B.C. The Hebrew Old Testament must have been available in its entirety for it to be translated commencing around 250 B.C. So see, it's way before he, Jesus Christ ever came to the earth and these prophecies were already written. Now, on this, um, there's a track that Chick puts out called Creator or Liar, which goes into this. And I have the back page of this, you're going to see it in the study, and it goes into the prophecy you know, Genesis 3-5 about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the Creator, filled over um, just 30 prophecies when He was allowed to be murdered by a man. That's just 30 of the 456. But He fulfilled 30 in the Old Testament, which would which had been set in stone written at no later than 250 years before He was born. And this goes through all the prophecies and all the fulfillments. Genesis 3.15, and the fulfillment in John 19.18. Exodus 12.46, it was fulfilled in John 19.36. goes on and on and on and on. So I said, it takes a lot more faith to believe in evolution than it does to believe in what I'm proposing. Okay, now let's go further. I'm actually doing pretty good here. Um, I mean, as far as moving through the material. Um, the movie, the Zeitgeist movie, now this is from another guy, this is another guy that um, wrote an update on this. And I want to present different sides of different ways people are approaching rebutting this, because I think there's merit to different ways of looking at this. The movie, or at least the first 37 minutes, demonstrates how Christianity is merely a recycled version of pagan myths about ancient deities such as the Egyptian god Horus. It goes on to argue in subsequent parts of the film that the events of 9-11, the income tax, the central banking system, these types of things. But we're not going to get into that, as I said before, uh, today. I've been getting... Now, this man, he's been getting emails about this, okay? And I've heard this from other people as well. This One said, my friend asked me to look at this video. As soon as he saw the video, he stopped practicing Christianity because of it. You know what, if this is all it's going to cause you to fall away, the Bible says that anything that can be shaken will be shaken. Okay? And if it were possible, even the very elect would be deceived. If this is all it's going to cause you to fall away, well, it's better, because you weren't ever saved anyway. What is your faith in? Your faith was so, it would be like the the, the seed that fell on stony ground, it was never able to take root. talks about the four different types of seeds. Okay? What this movie is going to do is really separate a lot of the, um, I guess, Christian pretenders from those that are really Christians. And it's going to be one tool that's used for that. See, God would rather you choose sides. Choose whom this day you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, as Joshua said. So this guy, he stopped, as soon as he saw, he stopped practicing Christianity. And then it says, it claims that Jesus never existed, but rather he was made up for political reasons to control the population. How how ludicrous. It relates the life of Jesus with other gods, and that the Bible is more astrological than anything else. Again, lies from the pit of hell. And then it says, what do you think all of it 
what do you think of all the claims in it? This was the email sent to this guy. Then this man responds, below is my response, but for more reading on this topic, I want to encourage anyone dealing with this stuff to check out this site, which is full of great articles. Now, the site is, um, I put the link in this thing, you can go look at it further. By the way, if it sounds like I'm a little upset, I am. I can't believe how disingenuous people can be. I'm deeply saddened that people are falling for it. I don't know where to start. The video is a complete lie. First off, the video is full of misinformation about Horace. He was baptized? Oh, really? I would really love to see the source for that. Most of it, most of the supposed parallels are completely untrue. Actually, the Muslim apologists have been trying to do this for centuries, to say that Christianity is just really another form of paganism. But that's a lie. Consider the source. Most of the information in this video seems to be from... Kara S.'s book, The Christ Conspiracy. And that's true. That's where they're getting their information from. This person named, who calls herself Akara S., she wrote The Christ Conspiracy of 1999, which is a sensationalist book which has zero academic credibility. If you want to learn more about the Horus, you can read the ancient myths about him. I mean, at least get it from a pagan source that's going to get their paganism right. And I'm going to... He gives you several links you can go to here. Let's just go over the data. Horus was not born of a virgin. That's a lie. We're going to look at this further. Horus was not baptized. That's a complete fabrication. And then he says, Anup, the baptizer, which they talk about in the Zeitgeist, this movie, show me where you find that one. Anup, the baptizer, the supposedly baptized Horus. Horus never walked in water. He did not perform miracles, but raising the dead and walking on water, or he did perform miracles, but raising the dead and walking on water were not among them. If he performed any miracles, it was purely from a demonic standpoint, and the Bible says the Antichrist is going to come with all lying signs and wonders, and it's no marvel that, that, that his ministers can be transformed into ministers of righteousness. Of course, I don't even think he was even portrayed as that ever. He was a devil from the beginning. So, um... Horus had disciples. But you can't show me a single reference to him having twelve. And, and again, we've already looked at that. So that's another lie. Horus never taught in the temple at the age of twelve. That's another lie. It's just not there. It's not in the pagan literature to support this stuff. Where was, where, where was ever said that Horus was crucified? That's another lie. He died in a later version of the story and was brought back to life. But Jesus' but Jesus' resurrection was more than a mere coming back to life. His, his body was transformed and changed. Anyway, it was only later added to the Horus legend. Okay? So it depends what, what version you're reading. That's just off the top of my head. That should give you some indication, though, about the reliability of this film. In short, its claims are lies. They're, they're told to sell movies and books. But no scholar in the world would accept this stuff, only the ignorant. Anybody can get a book published or a video made and say whatever they want. That doesn't make it true. I mean, hey, Anton LaVey got the, uh, the Satanic Bible published in 1966. Is that true? Moreover, to think that Jesus didn't exist is absolutely, positively unfounded, unhistorical, and unrealistic. Those who oppose Christianity from the very beginning never asserted that Jesus didn't exist. In fact, they made all kinds of slanderous claims against Jesus, but they never asserted he was a myth. I mean, this is taking it to a whole other level here of, of just craziness. In fact, there's more evidence Jesus existed than virtually anybody in antiquity. And again, we already looked at the proof. And there isn't a single res respectable scholar today, Christian or secular, who would make such a claim. Only those who haven't studied the issue seriously could say such a thing. Let's go further. Another person explained that the sources for the movie have been posted online. Follow the link and what a shocker. The primary source for the movie's claim about Jesus and Christianity is said to be Akarsha S.'s book, The Christ Conspiracy. Again, this book is not an ac academic work and has zero credibility in academic circles. According to this very site, one of Acacia S.'s sources is said to be John Allegro, a man whose work has frequently been condemned by scholars. Now, I give you for the full rebuttal to the Christ Conspiracy book, it's, it's answeringinfidels.com. You can go to this. I can't even go into all this stuff. It's too much. Okay? But I'm telling you, 
This book, this movie has been refuted eight ways to Sunday. It's, it's, it's unbelievable the amount of overwhelming evidence you can get to, to refute this. For example, when John Allegro attempted to publish a translation of the Dead Sea Scrolls, 14 Oxford scholars wrote to the publisher and demanded it be pulled. It was an absolute inaccurate translation. Now, this is one of the um, uh, sources for the Christ Conspiracy book, which is what the zeitgeist, the first 37 move first 37 minutes of the zeitgeist was based on. Okay, John Allegro. John Allegro, so he attempted to publish this translation of the Dead Sea Scrolls. 14 Oxford scholars wrote to the publisher and demanded it be pulled, and it, because it was so inaccurate, the book was pulled, and, pu and the publisher even apologized. That's, that's a great source that I'd want, you know, to, to de determine my ultimate, um, uh, you know, determine my ultimate existence and determine where I'm going to wind up, either in heaven or hell. I would want to put my faith in John Allegro's hands. When you watch the Zeitgeist and you and you and you basically buy into this, that's exactly what you're doing. A critique was written by John Strugno, which meticulously, which meticulously revealed in a line by line treatment the errors, and which was was longer than Allegro's book itself. He put out a book refuting Allegro's book, and the book was longer than Allegro's book. That's how much error it was filled with. I mean, now again, this is reference stuff I'm talking about here. So when you get this, you can go to the references and look this stuff up. Go further. The fact is, no scholar takes Allegro's work seriously. You will only see his name mentioned in academic journals, such as the Journal for the Historical Jesus, not a particularly conservative journal, in articles listing the most outrageous examples of poor scholarship. Of course, you won't find scholars quoting from Akarsha S.'s book either, The Christ Conspiracy. Again, read the ancient sources themselves and see what they say about Horus. He was not baptized, crucified, etc. It may sell many movies, and it may appeal to those who already want to dismiss Christianity. Oh, that's the ultimate goal. But the Jesus Horus comparison has no academic value whatsoever. This guy, Michael Barber, he's a PhD. That was that was his uh, thing there. Okay, I'm looking at what I have left here. I'm going to go ahead and end this part two here, and we're going to go to part three right now, and hopefully I can get through with part three. So, may the Lord Jesus Christ richly bless you, and we'll see you soon.